Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we're bringing back one of my favorite thinkers about code, Sunil Pai. Sunil, how you doing? I'm doing fine, Jason. How's it going? Nice to see you. <laughs> what are we doing? Is this just like the, yeah, let's this go. Is a, this is what the young kids do. <laughs> yeah, let's fucking go. I mean, like, this is the part where like, I'm going from my couch. Can I just stay home? Work for, uh, go from couch. Like, I'm just doing it from home. But yeah, this oh, is, this is my it. new thing. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I mean, we got we got a lot of folks in the chat already. People are, are, are real talkative, which is really exciting. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different from the, the standard format because, to be completely honest, this is going to be more of like a discussion of the future of, of web dev rather than a, a strict demo. Um, and I'm so excited about it. Like how often do we get a chance to just sit and, and really talk through what's possible with the tech that's that's coming through and, and kind of what it's gonna unlock for us. But before we dive into that, for folks who aren't familiar with your work, do you wanna give us a little bit of a, a background? Uh, sure, uh, my name is Sunil. I currently work as a tech lead for developer productivity on the workers team in Cloudflare. Uh, and we'll go into what software workers, et cetera, is in a while. Uh, some folks might know me because I spent a year on the React team and flamed out. Uh, previously to that, I did a bunch of CSS and JS stuff, uh, just some open source thing like for a while. Uh, and uh, oh, uh, people might know me from uh, shit posting on Twitter, where I spend <laughs> at least ten to eleven hours a day. I think I think that's mostly it. Folks know me like from Twitter. They're like, "Who the fuck is this guy?" Like, I but, think yeah. that's that maybe is is my favorite. Okay. Hello, I'm Sunil Pai. You may know me from shit posting on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we're gonna have to put the uh, the explicit warning on this episode, but. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Come on, man. There are all adults here. And I'm not saying anything that their parents or their bosses don't already say. It's fine. This is true enough. Is true fine. enough. Um, okay. So today I want to talk specifically about something that, um, you know, you're at Cloudflare. I'm at Netlify. I, I think that our companies are kind of pushing forward. Uh, a really big bet on the future of the internet, which is this idea of edge compute. Um, so Cloudflare is is in on this. Dino is is another kind of avenue toward this. Netlify is building on top of Dino. Vercel is building on top of Cloudflare. Um, it, Supabase is building on top of Dino. We're we're seeing a lot of companies starting to to realize that like there might be something here. This might change things. And I'll tell you what, when, when I started to really get my head around what edge computing potentially unlocked, I haven't been this excited about web development in a long time. Um, mm -hmm. so, so maybe it's just a, what's the elevator pitch? Why, what is edge computing? Um, Oh, okay. so first thing I guess is that it's an overloaded term and like some companies <laughs> call it something, some, but I, I think, okay, let's talk about some of the common characteristics, right? The mm -hmm. first thing is that servers are as close as possible to the users as they can physically be, like literally mm -hmm. physically uh, they can be. And these providers of these servers are actually making deals with like telecom networks and so on so that they have incredibly low latency and like it's cheap to run stuff. But I think the common one is you uh, have servers as close as possible to the users. And the way to do that is to blanket the planet with servers, like as many deals as you can. So even if you start making an edge pro, uh, if you create, make, make yourself an edge company today, you might start with like 10 cities, but the goal is not just to be in 10,000 cities in the future, but eventually to have a server behind your washing machine. Like mm. everybody should have one like in their house. How yeah. physically close can you get this thing to be and then start running code off it? So I think that's what they mean by edge because I think it used to refer to the edge of the network, like a last mile thing. Right. Uh, and I think that's where the word edge came from. But that is the big one, which is the, hey, what happens when we cover the planet with hardware and let people use it? Well, and so, that yeah, so like, that's kind of like if we if we do a little bit of just kind of historical, like evolutionary uh, backtracking for for so everybody buckle up, we're going to do like a, a 
what was that thing called? Um, like the conjunction junction. What's your function? What was that? That uh, Schoolhouse Rock. We're gonna do Schoolhouse Rock on uh, on the history of delivering content over the internet. So back in the early early days of the internet, the only way that content would go on the internet was if you had a physical computer in your house and you would have that on and connected to the internet. Somebody would then enter the address of that computer and you would be able to load a file from it. So. If you were on the other side of the planet, you're limited by the speed of light, by the speed of networks, and how long it takes for that request to get to that other computer and then deliver that document back. Obviously, this was prohibitively difficult to, to enter for most people. So then we started looking at hosting companies, and we all were using GoDaddy or Bluehost or DreamHost or whatever, you know, HostGator, all these different companies, and they would run a room full of servers for you. But again, this is usually one server in a building somewhere on the planet. Like then we started seeing AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, IBM Cloud, all these different companies started building multiple data centers. And we've got, you know, like AWS, US East One, US West Two, the European data centers, the Asian data centers, Australia, et cetera. So now you've got like copies of the data or you can choose to run your servers in different places. Um, and then we, well, I guess at the same time, we started putting together CDNs, content delivery networks, where you could take assets, not necessarily code, like not executables, but like assets, your images, HTML documents, stuff like that. You could put those on lots and lots and lots of points of presence or, or shorthand pops, um, that, you know, there's maybe dozens or hundreds or what, how many does Cloudflare have like hundreds, right? Um, all over I think the planet. Upwards of 10,000 at some point. Yeah, Holy yeah, crap. Yeah, oh, yeah like okay. So 10,000 10, different like places on the internet. So when you make a request to Akamai or Cloudflare or something like that, your, your request is only going, you know, 10 miles instead of 2,000 miles across the ocean. Um, and But the limitation of that, of course, was that these were for assets only. So then we started looking at like, well, servers are a pain to maintain. Maybe we can just do serverless functions, but serverless functions are limited to US East 1, uh, US West 2, the, the big data centers. So edge compute, edge functions, how, or, or Cloudflare workers, or this idea of the, the edge computing layer is, well, what if these like CDN pops, these 10,000 locations around the world could run a little bit of code? Now you have a server right next door. You don't have to wait for these requests to happen. Um, and we're seeing this move where like, you know, Cloudflare is doing this, Netlify is doing this, Dino is doing this, Supabase is doing this. So it's not just like the host. It's not like, you know, oh, Cloudflare will give you, will give you uh, this distributed edge network. Netlify will give you this distributed edge network but like you still have to go back to US East one for your database, so who cares? Now it's like, well, I don't know, if you're running like Supabase, your your request to Supabase and your request to uh, to the, the edge network are right next to each other. So this is literally like everything's happening almost in your house, in your neighborhood at least. Um, that's incredible. And we're, we're also like, I think planet scale now has like, uh, uh they call them portals. It's distributed uh, edge networks of read only to give you very almost near instantaneous requests anywhere in the world. Um, Sunil, how did I do? How uh, did I miss any major points as I was trying to give that history? Actually, it's pretty bang on. The one thing that yes. I think uh, that happened in parallel is at alpha engineers in the 90s or 80s, actually more 90s, I guess believed that they needed complete control of these hardware machines to do anything. And mm -hmm. when I meant they needed complete control, it's kind of, uh, it's a level of gatekeeping as well, right? Like you have to be a webmaster who understands how to set up services and SSH into the machine and run logs. Mm -hmm. uh, the level of that kind of control slash management actually goes down the further into history, uh, the closer to the present that you come, which is... right. Uh, AWS says, okay, uh, you can use uh, US East 1, US East 2, but A, you have to still pick which locations, but you don't get to SSH into these Lambda machines, right? Like we'll just pin up, a, you just give us a container, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the extreme, which is like Cloudflare and I assume Netlify as well, which is you don't get to pick which part of the world it is. In fact, it tries to deploy it to all across the world. Right. But really all you're given is a JavaScript function. And I think that's actually part of the secret sauce as well. But 
<laughs> giving up this level of control suddenly gives you so much power that a, pro- a provider like Netlify or Cloudflare can take off for you, or take care of mm-hmm. for you, which is great because it does my favorite thing that technology does, which is it makes incredibly hard things access- accessible to like mere mortals. Where yes. I don't, I, I don't want to learn C++ to run a server. You know what I mean? I don't want to learn how to configure Nginx. That's not my problem. There's like a whole army of people in Cloudflare taking care of this. Me, I like JavaScript. Can I write a function that takes a request and returns a response? Fuck yeah, that's all I want. Well, okay, so, so I think so that's the other thing. I feel like you just tapped yeah. into like one of my my other favorite things, which is that we've you know the, there's a complaint about about so many distributed services or or all you know you need a, a specialized service for each thing. But when I think about it, I get really excited because what I'm seeing is a complete flattening of the learning curve, where if you become really good at HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, Mm -hmm. it used to be that full stack developers didn't technically exist because you had, you know, there was just so much to learn that you couldn't possibly really be full stack. You could just be kind of like good over here and like a little bit of information on these other things, you can literally be full stack now because you can run JavaScript on the server. You can run it in serverless functions, edge compute on the front end. Like if you become a JavaScript, HTML and CSS expert, you are a, you are a one developer army. You can build anything because all of these services have been put together that you can assemble and connect and it's all API calls and fetch calls and like, that's it, right? You're, you're building incredible shit. Uh, Another thing I like about that is because you mentioned it is a, uh, nobody owns the technology. Well, Mm. Oracle owns the trademark to JavaScript, I think, but nobody (laughs) owns the tech, but because it's the so-called standards API that everyone's doing, it means that let's say, uh, Let's say you get really pissed off with Cloudflare. Mm-hmm. You can spend literally a week and migrate to Netlify. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, there are there are some issues of like, okay, I, this is how I have to handle environment variables and change. But your code, pretty much the same thing. It's a request response function, whatever. So that means that, A, uh, companies are now incentivized to compete on uh, the quality of service and customer experience, which is, right. hey, how can, how can we keep you happy? Like, how can we keep you happy using this? Sure, like, we have a nine millisecond latency thing, but can we make sure that your business runs on us? Because if we don't do it, you lose, not you don't lose the game, but it would suck. And you would move to someone who's like nicer and treats you better. And I love that. Those are the perfect incentives for capitalism, where they don't have anything proprietary per se uh, and help. Uh, I like one of the nice things about Deno and Deno Deploy, right, is that it kind of was a forcing function for Cloudflare to announce open sourcing the runtime, which we always wanted yeah. to do. But it it was very much a, you know what, I guess now is the right time to do it, because why not? We are right. not really competing on like what runs the JavaScript anymore. Well, and, and how many people are like, you know, you, you always in businesses, you, you've got a majority of the company is like, hey, let's do the right thing. And everybody's like, yeah, we should. We don't have time. Right. And so what I love about competition is that competition raises those needs to do the right thing, because the when the competition is built on on this, on experience, on like treating people right, like that's the type of capitalism I love, because it basically means, oh, all that tech debt about like your API is awful to use. You got to fix that or else you're going to die as a company because 15 other companies just shipped an amazing developer experience. Right, um, exactly. So I, I love, you know, as, as you said, it's it's a really good forcing function for for the way that companies make decisions when we move to this world where it's not about proprietary lock-in. It's not about building an experience that only works on your platform. It's about building an experience that's so good that like, yeah, I can ship whatever next js on any you know on cloudflare on netlify on vercel on whatever but which one feels the best to use like and and that's kind of the you know what else can i do what when i want to get to this edge stuff i want to do personalization am i am i using an api i like am i you know if i want to add extra things or i want to ship i don't know maybe our marketing site's going to be an astro or quick or something like that how does it feel to ship that right like we're all we're all competing now on making developers lives easier as opposed to like, ha ha, you're stuck with us because you paid for an enterprise contract and you can't go anywhere else. <laughs> That's right, right? And you, we, you, we gave you a certification and like that's just it. When a company says that you need a certification to use their technology, mm. <laughs> AWS, uh, 
it kind of sucks because that that kind of is a weird lock in in itself where you have it's, I, I wouldn't call it a cult but it's weird that you need a certification to do that what i want is commonly used idioms and code and i want to use fucking npm like i i, I want to install libraries from yeah. npm that i can use on these things uh but there is then a difference right which is then companies do think to themselves oh how can we differentiate themselves so i think netlify has a couple of products that i really like uh, one is uh, what is Sean Grubbs thing that you acquired recently one netlify graph called... we we acquired one graph beautiful what a concept right which is a uh, hey we know that you have all these integrations let us make that part simple for you and mm -hmm. it's just part of your experience with netlify cloudflare goes this whole other way which is a uh, hey we have this sci-fi thing called durable objects what can you make with it? And I'm like, holy shit, I don't know, but it looks super exciting. And you want to build like uh, web socket -y multiplayer stuff on that, which mm. Deno is, so I, I think, which is interesting to me also because none of these ideas then are particularly proprietary in themselves because then you're like, okay, fine. If somebody else wants to build it, they can build it. But mm -hmm. at least it's not a, uh, we got you to use one thing and now your entire application has to be on our stack because right. of reasons. So, uh, so this is, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but like, you know, both, sure, I think yeah. both Cloudflare and Netlify uh, talk about the Jamstack as being kind of a, a, an application architecture that makes a huge difference. And a lot of that is uh, you, you have taken the web experience and made sure that it's not dictated by the business logic mm -hmm. in your, your APIs, your backends, whatever it is, you're just decoupling mm -hmm. that, that UI experience from the APIs or microservices you've built or third-party systems that you rely on, that data and business logic is accessed through an API, which means you can ship the, the web experience anywhere, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's a huge productivity boon to companies because then if they have some super pr proprietary backend that requires a lot of lock-in, that could be potentially great for your backend, but it's horrible for your users because that back end is for the back end, not for delivering front end experiences. And, mm -hmm. and so I think that, you know, the, the decoupling that we're getting out of this, this architectural shift where we're seeing companies move away from monolithic applications and to this idea of like a decoupled web experience means that, you know, we can, as front end teams, as, as web teams, we start looking at these experiences based on how do I get the best outcome for my use case? And like, we see this in research at Netlify when we're talking to developers, they like people don't get locked into Netlify or Cloudflare or Vercel. We almost always hear that that developers have like, oh, well, I deployed this site to Netlify and this site to Vercel and That's this right. site to Cloudflare. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because we all have our strengths, right? Like if I need durable objects, I'm going to Cloudflare. If I need, if I want, you know, whatever it is, like the the serverless function experience, or I want to use Netlify forms, or I want to like we have we all have our strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so to me. That's really exciting because again, the incentive now is like, how do we make this feel better to use and be more useful, give people a faster on-ramp or better guidance or, or whatever it is, rather than how do I force all front-end developers to put all of their websites on this? Because if they don't, it's broken. I fucking love that, by the way. Like, and uh, that, that's also appealing to me as a user because, well, as a web developer, nine out of 10 of your ideas are really just side projects that you just spin up on the weekend. <laughs> and if, anytime you start, start like you're like, okay, it's Friday evening. Oh, well, it's Saturday morning. Friday evening, I went out drinking. It's Saturday morning and I want to start up something. Mm -hmm. Is it easier for me to start? What, what, well, what is the shortest path to getting the shit working, right? Mm -hmm. Like I appreciate like boilerplates, but uh, framework boilerplates, but even those are sometimes very like, well, you actually have to learn the tech how to do it, uh, do it right. That's why Remix is nice because even they're leaning into this whole standards thing, which is quite appealing. Yeah. Uh, but it's also very much a, hey, can I start with literally writing a single function uh, and saying request response? Uh, because of this standards-based thing, you could technically run it in the browser itself directly. Mm -hmm. right? Like your first prototype is actually, I made an index.html and a JavaScript file and I ran it there and I'll figure out how to put it on the edge in a while. After a bit, I'm not uh, I'm not ready for that just yet. That is strangely liberating because I can remember at least like two or three years ago, where honestly part of it still persists today, which is Node used to be like dead simple. Now mm -hmm. it wasn't also super capable about ten years ago, but it used to be dead simple in the sense that you would literally say npm install express, copy five or six. And that was uh, the game. And yeah, that was it. You're 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 like you're you're there. But then it became this whole thing where 
okay, fine, you got it working. Now, where are you going to deploy it? Shit, I need a credit card number and this and that. And it started, and then just React started feeling a little like you have to set up a whole thing before you get there. And that started feeling a little weird. But with the return of like streaming APIs and now this edge thing where right. people are building what are called edge native frameworks, I think that's the phrase you're using. Like, mm -hmm. again, it's starting to crunch where people now can start focusing on, oh, this is the idea that I want to execute on today. You, Another you, thing I was thinking of is that the edge also works, like you were mentioning, right? Like there's a backend and an API that might belong in a monolithic fashion, but you can build your other things here. It turns out there are ways to bridge that. And this was such a good business idea that, so I don't know if you know Max Stoiber and Tim Suchanek, I think his yeah. name is, they built something called GraphCDN, which oh, is yeah. now called Stellate. And it's the simplest idea that's executed so well, which is, hey, you have an API, you're a GraphQL API, which is expensive as hell to uh, run. And what we'll do is we'll, you just install this one thing in your DNS service and enable with GraphCDN. And we give you caching, we give you replication across the world and they're using Fastly, I think, which is another great service. And now your thing is 10x better as a service, like instantly, you can do this like in two hours. And that's an interesting way to like bridge what without making any code changes in your own code to suddenly be, like reach the edge. Mm -hmm. I wish I'd come up with that idea. It's such a good idea. Shit. It's. I, I mean, it's it, and it's interesting too because it it really does point to like a lot of times the ideas that work are the simplest ideas. They're the things that it's like nobody wants to go and set up a CDN. You know, nobody wants to go wrangle a varnish cache. That's not. That's not fun. That's not a useful. Mm -hmm. That's not a useful application of development hours. Um, mm -hmm. And and to to your point about boilerplate, like no one wants to configure a domain name. No one wants to set up the 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 domain routing so that you've got the proxies in place to have your API run from serverless functions, but under your main site's domain. Like all that stuff should just disappear. And that's kind of the premise that like. You know, on, on the Netlify side, at least, that's sort of a premise we're built on. You deploy your site code and a folder with serverless functions in it and a folder with edge functions in it, and we'll wire all those up under one domain name so that you can just build. Like, I want you to go from an empty folder to building your idea in five minutes. Like, you should be deployed online looking at a running edge function, a running serverless function in five minutes. And from there, you're that just plugging together your ideas instead of going, how do I wire all this shit together? Like so many of my side project ideas died on the vine because I spent my entire weekend trying to get the stack right. Yeah. And I yeah, couldn't get all the yeah. pieces connected. And I was like, whatever, I'm out of time. I'm not going to work on this anymore. Yeah. I'm fucking done. I have a life. That's just it. Like once you enter your thirties, you're extremely <laughs> conservative with how much time you spend on like building a stack. I love that by the way, Netlify is folder of functions. Man, that's just it. Like, it's an idea that I've fought against for years, but now I realize that it's just like the trade offs are so worth it. Which is Next.js does this, which is folder of React components that are now hosted. The routes, like, yeah. You, you get routing for it. Netlify does this functions. And always, like, as a, as a nerd, I was like, well, what if you want to do anything custom? And then I was like, no, fuck it. Like, it's this is just a superior way to do this thing. I don't want her to set up a router and then, like, wire up little. You know, you have to write the slash uh, XYZ slash uh, bracket ID and you're, no man, like just give me a full PHP. Like that's just it. This is why PHP won. Everybody thought that it sucked, but like it's kind of why PHP won and still like works. But it's, Shit. yeah. And I think that's, uh, that's actually one of the things that I love is, is, and, and like, this is where I think um, like Remix got this really right, where they start with folder based routes where you've got your, you know, your app folder, you throw a, a page in there and that's your, those are your routes and those will get rendered anyways. You can do the wildcard routes if you want, or you can just straight up pull in react router and like do a full SPA as a, a subsection of your, of your remix app. If you do have a particularly aggressive thing that you want to build. Um, and, and I think that's a really kind of interesting and powerful approach where you're basically saying like, you're inverting it, right? You're, instead of saying like, in order to do anything, you have to know everything you're saying yeah, by default, yeah. this is going to make your life easier, but you can go as far as you want here. Um, I've written about this before. I, I, uh, I referred to it. I think the, what is it? The Nielsen Norman group calls it progressive disclosure. And so I wrote a, a post called progressive disclosure of complexity, Ooh, um, talking fine. about 
specifically this, right? Like we want to, whoops, where is it? Um, progressive disclosure of complexity. Where's the one that I wrote? I Here found it. it. Yeah. Um, but you know, these, these, these are the kinds of concepts where like, I, I want by default, if I take every shortcut, I use every default, I'm going to deploy something that is good, performant, easy to use, easy to maintain, easy to grow. And then as I hit the edges of the defaults, I can opt into more complexity to configure something, right. screw with it, change the way that it works, build something very complex and custom. But that should be driven by business needs, not by like, oh yeah, you've got a pile of Webpack and Babel and React and you got to wire all this shit together with plugins and now you're bringing taste in because you're setting up ES lint rules and you're setting up prettier yeah. config and you know now like every single project is functionally identical you're just putting React components on the internet but they're completely opaque to anybody who doesn't work in that code base and that's it's not because anything functionally changes just because we spent four fucking weeks making this webpack config so custom and now nobody understands right. it but me uh, what's even more worse is that it's sinister because it's seductive you feel like you're doing real oh, engineering, it's so right? much like fun. oh i installed like the webpack plugin and like i installed this and i wired this and Tell me this, does the Netlify CLI work with an empty folder of functions? I suspect it would, right? Yeah. Does it tell you, hey, you have an empty folder, now add a single file and like it'll start working? We we have like a Netlify function create that'll just drop in I see, a I hello see, okay. world in for you. Ah, that's just so nice because otherwise you're thinking like, it's nice to be able to run the CLI with no input. And then it's like, have the CLI tell you, oh, welcome to this and you can start doing things. Okay, that's mm -hmm. my idea. Okay, I need to uh, get to this. Okay, so edge compute. Uh, back to edge compute. Wait, so, hold on. Before we do uh, that, I just realized I we're we're like oh. thirty minutes in. I want to do a quick shout. We have live Please. captioning on this show. Let me switch over and actually show this to everyone. So um, we have live captioning on the show. We've got Ashley with us today, taking down all these words. Thank you so much, Ashley, for writing down our swears. Um, and that is made possible through White Coat okay. Captioning um, and our sponsors, Netlify, NX, and Backlight all kicking in to make the show more accessible to more people. And we are talking to uh, Sunil today, who is on Twitter shitposting, as you said, as 3.1, um, which is a joke that took me way too long to get. Chat, do you get it? Uh, do you get actually, it? Actually, it's... Uh, well, it, it, did, did, did they get it? Did folks in chat get it? Do you get it, chat? Do you get it? No. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I think I need it. It's his grade out of five. No, that is not correct. Uh, it's because Sunil's last name is Pi, and Pi is 3.1. Forget it. Ah, it's a good joke. Uh, um, <laughs> but I have to tell you, like this sounded so clever years ago when I started using it. But if you ever, if you ever have to spell out your email address on the phone, 3.1 at gmail.com, no numbers, oh. all words, no dots. It's the it's a fucking pain in the ass. I highly recommend not doing what I did. See, it's this is the coaching that, was... that we need in school. Like, don't don't teach us about like I don't yeah. know the all the the silly stuff that we have to learn. Like Woodshop, teach us how to choose a username that you can explain over the phone. This is, I mean, <laughs> at least it's not something like uh, oh god, no, I can't be that rude either. But I, that's just it. It's it's not something where I was in college and stoned and we. Uh, something particularly rude that I have to use professionally after that. Oh my God. Uh, so I, I definitely had a username when I was like 13 that just had like 69 in it and you just, you know, really uh, ridiculous stuff like that. Right. So I had to burn down and restart my whole web presence when I was like 17 years old. Cause I was like, Oh wait, I have to tell like adults what this is. You have to tell adults what this is. That, that's part of your identity after a point. Uh, Doom Slayer sixty nine X X X. You don't you, you don't you don't want to be that guy. No, you don't. You don't. Oh um, my god. Okay, yeah. so edge compute. Uh, one of the things that uh, that I make a point to do every time I go on this hype of like, oh fuck, edge is like everything and it's the future, is to be very clear of the trade offs. Uh, and uh, because uh, without the trade offs, you get a bunch of common questions right in the beginning. So the mm. first thing is that. None of these edge providers, okay, maybe a couple of them, fly.io, I think, they don't run Node, which is the standard for server-side mm -hmm. JavaScript right now. 
Uh, and this bothers people because the first thing they try to do is npm install express, which is just, mm -hmm. and that's the nice thing about the Node.js ecosystem, right? Which is that it actually has, wow, at this point it has 12, 13 years of a history and ecosystem behind it. Like there are libraries that just work, et cetera. Express wasn't great because of its router, but it was because you had a selection of middleware that you can use to set up a website at any point of time. You get cores, cookies, mm -hmm. session storage, that talks to your Redis instance or whatever. And suddenly you come onto the edge and you're like, well, yeah, we don't do those things yet. We are working on it. Ooh. And it disappoints a lot of people. But, but wait, right? but wait, right? Because we do, we do. This is what edge, like this is actually what made it click for me when I started thinking about edge computing. Edge functions or, or Cloudflare workers are effectively middleware for the entire web regardless of framework or backend or anything like that because mm -hmm. like if you think about the the request response chain right i i'm in my browser i type in a url and i go and i hit whatever asset store or cdn or or you know wherever it is and i get a document back and that document is always going to be a collection of html and css and javascript right sure. that's what's coming back and cloudflare workers and edge functions are going to let me intercept that response or intercept that request and do different things. I'm going to check your cookies to make sure that you have an authorization header. I'm going to check to see if you've shown interest in a certain thing and swap the order of how uh, products are displayed on this page before I send it back to you. So now we're doing personalization. We're doing authorization, all these things that you would do in express middleware, right? But we don't yeah, need, yeah, we don't need good. that node server running. We don't need to have the, the, underlying like express api of setting up all my get requests i just get to say whenever we make a request if the url matches this one do this extra logic so well which is the trade off by the way that's just for it. me uh, you, but but that's the trade off that you have to be explicit about right which are yes. there are things potentially still happening on these servers that you are well which are very familiar and that you're used to and in the most common use case you're adding function you're either adding power and functionality or you're reducing your costs or maintenance costs on, on, on these servers. And if you're not very clear about this trade-off, people come in saying, well, oh shit, you mean, you mean I do need to run AWS somewhere? Netlify, that's why Netlify's model and even Vercel's model is really nice, right? Which is that you actually provide both as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, Cloudflare doesn't right now. Cloudflare's like, yeah, you sort of have to bring your own, but also have you considered using Remix and hosting your whole app on this thing? Uh, and that is the tension right now, which is that we are actually in the middle of this transition phase of how far can we take it like to the edge? Right. Uh, that's one of the things that I like talking about. Uh, the other one is the state thing. Oh man, the state thing, like we could have a whole session just on that, which is a... a Okay, so the model that I have for edge slash serverless slash whatever is actually not that it's like ten thousands of servers on the on the planet. It's that it's actually this stretchy balloon like server on the planet. Okay, that, that's my mm. this is the thing I keep doing in meetings internally. Imagine a balloon stretched on <laughs> on Earth, and you get to like interact with the parts that are like closest to you. Uh, the thing about data is that the CAP algorithm, uh, the CAP theorem, CAP phenomenon, CAP, CAP theorem is immutable. So you will never have cons uh, consistency, availability, and par partitions, par uh, partitionability, whatever. You will never have all three of them simply because of the speed of light order. So the idea is either you have a central server somewhere, mm -hmm. which means that if you write data to it and if you read data from it, you will always get the truth. But if it's on the other side of the planet, you're host because it'll take that long to talk to. Right. Or you start spreading your data across the planet, which means there's the chance that your write goes to one place and your read goes to another place. Right. And now you're potentially reading old data. Uh, and then how do you have like consensus? What happens when uh, two people send writes to the same thing uh, uh, because they thought that they had a lock on being able to write to it? So who mm -hmm. wins? Like how do you do consistency amongst these things? Uh, and this problem is just completely exacerbated if you start spreading data. This is a general database problem, right? Like, right. And the way that a lot of people solve it is they say, okay, fine, only one of the centers is where you send writes, and you'll have read replicas across the planet, mm -hmm. and that's somehow we'll 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 make that work. Uh, anyway, ninety nine percent of all applications are 
uh, read heavy and you're like, okay, fine. For the common use case, maybe that's like good. And, but there and is this tension. There, yeah, there's definitely tension. And I, I suspect we'll find new, new patterns that emerge. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I think the thing that's really interesting too is that you, um, you, you also generally have, well, okay, things like Twitter notwithstanding, you generally have more mm -hmm. readers than writers to a database. Um, right. and, yes. and so that could lead to, you know, you, you have a migrating write point based on who's online so that it's faster for them. And like people who are out of the typical timeline, they just go a little bit further. And, and I think the other thing too, is that our expectations shift when we're performing operations. Like I know that I personally, I expect a form submission to take longer than a URL load. And so there's, there's a little bit of like built in leniency there. Um, and I guess that when, when talking about that trade-off, like you're a hundred percent, right? Like, I think that is a, a huge challenge for us. Um, but the trade-off is that like the reads and the writes are happening in us East one. So, so that when I start thinking about yeah. it like that, I'm like, ah, I think I'm okay with that. I think I'm okay with just faster reads. Like it's a net positive for me in at least uh, in every use case i've found it like i'm not building a i'm not building social media and i'm not doing like massively multiplayer online gaming so like i i know that i'm not hitting all the edge cases here but for like a document kind of thing i'm you we're updating a dashboard okay. together something like that it's enough for me i'm happy so my gut feel well there are two things one is that as front-end developers which i like to pretend to be even though well i my day job isn't really that anymore <laughs> Uh, it, it means that you can now uh, leverage a good user experience. And the thing I'm thinking about is, of course, stuff like optimistic updates, right? Mm -hmm. Or just showing nicer spinners or like leading the user through a path. Even having a small animation it might just give you a little enough delay for the right to seem uh, right. Uh, so there's that. One is that, of course, that uh, as, user, uh, uh, as user experience developers, we get to make that experience better. So you have optimistic updates that can this thing. Uh, the second one is it turns out then that over the last year, because of stuff like the edge, but also because running edge is like cheaper uh, and enables nice patterns for multiplayer. It turns out that multiplayer uh, data structures. So this is your YJS, this is auto merge. Auto merge is great, by the way, uh, I was playing with it. It's so simple and nice. Uh, and also libraries like live blocks and replicash mm. replicash also cool live blocks is cool right, live right. blocks is a popular one i see a lot of people using this uh, start becoming uh, the data primitives for doing uh, for doing these sorts of things and the reason that i'm calling uh, these data structures out specifically is that i think they now realize that they need to be usable by javascript developers who are incredibly entitled and want to get something running without having to learn algorithms they're just like give me a do you have a react component that lets me do this uh, so uh so i like personally believe that this year uh, last year i think is when it like started getting more serious this year is when it's uh hitting the mainstream and i suspect by 2023 it'll be way more common than not simply because of the prevalence of edge networks uh, mm -hmm. because people will be using local caches to write to that then sync to a centralized database somewhere, et cetera. Uh, I don't know whether, oh, like yeah, that's just it. It's yeah. not clear to me yet whether this adds new use cases or it actually eats into common things that people already do. But it does strike me as something that's going to become like a lot more popular in the next year. Yeah. So, so actually I want to, I want to dig into that for a minute because, um, I've seen I've seen a couple things that feel like they are unlocking or or potentially net new capabilities as a result of of edge compute. Um, and so one one example is I, I'm actually going to jump over and just and show this because it's easier to explain. Um, cool. So let me let me jump over here and get out of the the double double view here. So let's let's look really quickly at this uh, Node.js personalization. So. What I find really cool about this is this is a, a demo that I've made that is, um, let's see, we'll disable the cache and I'll also disable JavaScript. JavaScript, disable it. Okay, so what this is- Oh is a, shit, does Chrome DevTools now have a command chooser? It's a Apple P, or Command P does that now. 
Um, oh, okay, that's so good. nice. Okay, yeah, so nice. I learned with Jason. Awesome. Um, okay. But so, so check this out. So, so I built this little demo. It's like a list of products, right? And, and what I wanted to see mm -hmm. was with JavaScript disabled, what would happen if I wanted to personalize this using an edge function? And so I, I want to see like, there's two core, there's two categories, corgis and food. And so if I show mm -hmm. interest in food and uh, this is a placeholder page, but if I show interest in my food and I, I come back here and then I do that a couple times, my, my score is going to go up and apparently I'm Mm -hmm. Did I break this whole demo? I bet I did, didn't I? Come on, y'all. Well, it is, is showing it? corgis and food. I think, yeah, I think those are changed. Hold oh, on. Why is it I... showing a waterfall? I don't. Are my cookies disabled? What's going on? Something. So something is going wrong here because there should be. Oh, is maybe this is causing all of my cookies to clear too? One second. Let me let me try again, and make sure that this is actually doing what I want. Where are my cookies? Okay, there's a cookie, so I should now have food, right? So there's my food stuff, and then I come back, and it's not updating, which means I broke something. Okay, well, that demo was embarrassing. Um, what it was doing before was with mm -hmm. JavaScript disabled, it was uh, it was shifting the order of these. Um, and then like, I see. Th there was another one um, that I was working on that was like, what if we took plain HTML and we did like a link tree and it updated in the background with your your latest stats, right? Like this is all powered. If we look at the, the actual source code, this post count or the episode count, that's not part of what's being done here. Um, and it was cached at the edge to try to make that a little bit faster. So it upgraded in the background, kind of a stale while we validate thing. Um, but this mm -hmm. is all like enhanced on the edge and there's no JavaScript running on this page. So these are like, I feel like I'm just screwing around here, but I'm imagining full fledged, no client side JavaScript frameworks. Like what does a remix look like that does all the dynamic shit in an edge function so that you never ship a single byte of client side JavaScript to the browser? Like it, it feels right, so like let, that's let, an open door here. Okay, so let me see if I understand this use case right, right? Which is you have a node server or some server which does some basic layout and generates this list, but then you intercept it with an edge function and you add all this dynamic shit. Yeah, but so, because you're so, using the edge and it's just so cheap, the, the what would have otherwise been expensive and hard to integrate into this thing is now just a thing that like the edge takes care of for you. Is that, is that a way that is, am I reading this right? Exactly. Right. So, so check this out. I, I, I have a, a suite of serverless functions here and each one goes off and hits whatever service, um, and checks my follower count or whatever it is. And then I send it back with a, uh, what is that? A, a how many, what is that? A 10, an hour long TTL. So once it runs once, it's just cached at the edge as if it was a static asset, uh, as a, like a static JSON file for an hour. And so if you request it again, it just, you know, it comes back nice and fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what I'm doing on the edge and, and so, yeah, this functions folder, I've got like one that's just grouping all those up into a single stats call. So I only have to make one request. And then I go into this edge function here and the edge function is uh hitting or not that it's hitting the the all all call for the stats which is that serverless function and then it's using the html rewriter which is something that came out of cloudflare to look for this data enriched true html attribute right and then it just yeah. adds in this this thing just this little span that says oh, here's the beautiful. here's the data right and that's all that it takes. And I'm not shipping any JavaScript. I'm just enhancing the response that's being sent to the browser. And so that's why this I is so it. exciting to me. Like we're literally opening a door here where somebody mm. who doesn't know a bunch of backend stuff, who doesn't know how to configure Express or deal with all the middleware or anything like that, can use technology like HTML Rewriter, use technology like Edge Functions, drop them in a folder alongside their front end. Cause like, if we look at this, my my main, where am I actually shipping here? I'm shipping, oh, I'm just shipping an HTML file, literally an HTML file. So like I ship a SVG icon and a link to it, right? So like this link to my blog, 
that's all that's on the page and i'm just shipping a, a beautiful span, a, love a it patch. like this, is, really this nice. is so freaking cool to me there's so much possibility here uh mm -hmm. i'm just i'm very very excited about the the possibilities that this unlocks in terms of of being able to do all the dynamic stuff that we cared about and not having mm -hmm. to uh ship any client-side javascript like it's kind of a have your cake and eat it too moment if you think about it from a like can it, will this work with javascript disabled does this work on a feature phone is this still performant even if somebody's loading this on a 1999 nokia flip phone right like they all of those things are are do they have nokia flip phones in 99 probably not right um but <laughs> uh, well i had a 3310 in 2003 so i don't know yeah, yeah I don't oh, no i'm sure they had flip phones <laughs> I, I don't know if the nokia had one but I'm, um, I'm old i don't remember uh, but what i also like about your code of course is that at no point did you have to do all the other things that are would have been associated with uh, running a dynamic website, right? Like you didn't have to provision any servers. Mm -hmm. You don't have to look at server health. <laughs> uh, you didn't have to write uh, server dot listen on so and so port, etc. No, it's very right. much a hey. I assume you wrote a function that returned a response object. That that not a, that's just it. That took in one response object and then started rewriting it and just returned it back out like you're just piping. yeah the, oh, it's that's here's the whole config i i did a rewrite so that my my functions were at a api like url um mm -hmm. and then i did this i said the edge function should run on the home page that's it right the, that's the whole that's config it. i all the proxies all the coordination all the dns all that stuff is just it just works i don't have to care or know about it i just i just know it's happening um, and, and to me, that feels like, you know, th this is what we're talking about when we're talking about companies competing on experience, shit like this makes me want to build complicated things because I don't have to figure out how to configure route 53 and the API gateway and AWS Lambda and, you know, whatever other sort of like cloud front and S3, like, I don't have to connect all that shit together and figure out how it works. I just get to say, all right, well, I got a folder full of all my logic. Here's my whole app edge functions and functions ship it it's all right i'm done like <laughs> right yeah, i just i had yeah. an idea i shipped this i think i spent maybe in two hours on this and it's so, like there must be a metric that we can pull out of this i know superbase i just learned recently that one of their success metrics internally is what they call time to first query so as soon as a user signs uh... up how sh how short is the time? How long is the time between them signing up and making the first query? Mm -hmm. And a success metric is making it as small as possible. And that's just such a beautiful number. I was thinking to myself, which is that's that's a thing that means that the experience of using Superbase is simple, hopefully. Uh, so what then is the success metric for a framework like this? So what is your time to, I want to say first render, but like that doesn't make sense because you could cheat with just a boilerplate, right? Or boilerplate mm -hmm. and you spin out. Well, really, I guess the time, the question is, and I hate this phrase because it sounds like it's just, it's capitalism shitting all over it, which is your time to business logic. How, how long did it take you before you started writing the code that mattered and not the code that otherwise was needed? I, I, yes. I, well, that, that's that's not a very good phrase, but you see, you get what I'm saying, right? Like that's the sort yeah. of thing that stuff like this enables, which is it. And in your scenario, for example, it literally was, hey, I had to make a project and make up that one TOML file, which, well, I assume you didn't need that when you started up mm -hmm. and uh, started using HTML rewriter. Well, you had to know the API for that. I think that's I think that's well, another and... thing that this. Sorry, go. Well, I was just going to say the, the thing that I find really, really fascinating about this is like we we really are talking about like HTML rewriter is a jQuery like syntax and the API is is pretty straightforward. And, you know, it's got mm -hmm. TypeScript autocomplete. So if you're using VS Code, you can just kind of dot look at the thing and and see what's available. Um, so so the, the thing that I find really encouraging about this is that the vast majority of what we're doing here is, well, go to MDN and look at what a request object looks like yeah. and you're good yeah. to go, right? Look at a response object, you're good to go. You can set some headers, you can set some cookies, you can change the data. And like the the auxiliary stuff is all like, I don't like, you know, workers are gonna provide the geo and, um, you know, sure. extra context sure. and, and edge functions do the same where we get this context object with bonus information, but it's not like 
you got it. You don't need to care about that at all. It's only relevant if that's what you're trying yeah. to do. I want to show you where you're requesting from. Great, cool, do that. Um, but yeah. it's it, it, as far as I'm concerned, I just used a bunch of web standards to do some really advanced stuff, uh, which actually is a, a good like segue into a question from Eka FYI in the chat. She asks, "How do edge functions differ from regular Lambda functions?" And the 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 clarification on that is like, we can serve no JavaScript SSR pages with serverless functions. So in her eyes, the the main benefit seems to be caching in worldwide servers closest to the user. Um, are there any other differences in your mind? Uh, the big one, of course, is that lambdas right now are heavy as shit. Like it's using a runtime, mm -hmm. which is Node, that was not designed for this use case. So uh, either this, I, if last I checked, uh, feel free to correct me. I think start, lambda startup time was anywhere close between 150 and 200 milliseconds. Like when what? you make a uh, what we call a cold start. Mm -hmm. And I think Amazon literally sells you a service called concurrency that lets you keep them warm right. so, that, uh, they, that, so that they're effectively zero. But if you look at these new breed of runtime, so that's Cloudflare Workers, Deno Deploy, uh, Bun is the new one. But by the way, hi, Jared. Like, God, that guy's such a beast. Uh, uh, Fastly's uh, thing that's powered by Wasm, they literally run a JS runtime in Wasm. They've compiled it down to, it's kind oh, of shit. crazy tech. I love it. Uh, but those things are built for this use case, in which case, like the, the startup time is like under 10 milliseconds. And in most cases, it's zero because right. they do a hack where while you start making the HTTPS handshake, they already start warming it up. So it's ready by the time the request comes. Mm. So it's, it's, it's cheap to run. It's really quick to start up, which means suddenly that you can use it as a general. This is the big deal, right? Which is imagine if I told you that every function that you call took 200 milliseconds to run. Uh, before it even started running. That wouldn't be a very good compute primitive. You'd always be thinking of how can I batch this shit? Can I pay AWS more, et cetera? But no, with these new runtimes, you can conceptually think of it as a, you know, you make a little architecture diagram with pipes of your code. You can tell yourself, well, okay, this part I'm going to run on like Netlify. And you will not, you're not, fuck it, multi-provider. These functions I'll run on Cloudflare. And you wire them together. And because the hardware A is so close and because the runtime has been designed for this use case, it's almost like it's running locally, like they're all running together. And that's the big deal here, which is that they've been well, designed from scratch for this use case. And, and, and this is what I think is like, if we, if we, if you and I are right about this, the logical conclusion of how edge compute works is exactly what you said, where we're literally able to ship little logical containers to like every router in the, in the world. Because it, honestly, like that's how things are gonna work. You'll just kind of slowly get these these warm connections to services that you go to, and they'll be smart enough to know, like, hey, I hit this website a lot. Let me let me pull all of their CDN stuff right into my router so that it just executes here. Boom, done. Right. And exactly. and there's so many interesting like outgrowths of that. What does it what does it mean? And and if we start looking at this idea of like decentralization, like crypto notwithstanding, but just this idea of like you can kind of do data ownership in this this sort of way where it's distributed across the world. Like that doesn't mean that you have to have a server in your house. I think this is kind of where where that conversation always breaks down for me is it's like, well, own your data. Okay, well what does owning your data mean? Well it means you have to have a physical device that your data is on. I'm like, okay, well I'm never going to do that. Like, cool. This conversation yeah, no. is dead to me. <laughs> but if I can, you know, if I'm able to like use services that, that duplicate the data so that I am the, the de facto owner of it in the sense of like, I've got all the copies and like, if one service goes down, who cares? It's, it's there. Mm -hmm. And that's distributed globally in a way that is really close to users. Like now I'm kind of interested in this idea of like, okay, let's, let's see how we can do this. Let's get global redundancy. Let's figure out ways to get data really, really close to users and make sure that it's not centralized to like one server cluster in one region. Um, it, it really does kind of get my gears turning about how many things we can do. The data ownership thing is also, as you can imagine, internally at Cloudflare, we talk about it. We have a tech called durable objects, mm -hmm. which for the sake of discussion here, and it's very sci-fi, but for the sake of discussion, let's say that it's one JavaScript object that can live in one data center that's like closest to you that you can spin up. Mm. Uh, and one of the interesting APIs it has is that it ha when you create it, uh, it has uh, a configuration parameter called jurisdiction. 
which currently only takes one value, EU. And the idea is, if you uh, if you have GDPR regulations to follow, uh, and you pass it this jurisdiction EU, it'll make sure that the objects are hosted only inside the EU. Oh, fascinating! But that's right. But the fact is that that is just the only value it takes right now. A, you can expand that now to multiple countries. I think right. India will come up with the data privacy law, etc. Whoever like this thing, and we'll expand that. But in this data ownership thing, let's say I can buy a stupid rack from Cloudflare. And like I was mentioning, I'll put it right behind my washing machine. And now jurisdiction is the ID of this stupid, of this uh, server. Boom. I kind of have data ownership locally on hardware that I own. And right. I can now write a little worker on top of it that lets you access it if you pass some auth and some some values, right? And, but and if you're using more, Cloudflare... Uh, like more practically... Uh, if if we think about a lot of bigger companies, they're doing this stuff with local VPNs and firewalls. Like, I want the jurisdiction to be my VPN, right? There or, you go, on-prem. This is your answer for on-prem. Sure. Yeah. Here, here's your and, and this is the, like, I mean, I watched IBM tie itself into logical knots to, to, to explain the concept of hybrid cloud, where it was like uh -huh. half on-prem, half cloud so that they could convince companies that they did in fact own all of their data and all those kinds of sure. things. And it, it ended up being a lot of stuff like that. It was these really complicated firewall rules and VPN access control and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and this idea that, you know, again, if what companies are competing on is the experience of setting this stuff up, if I get to say like my jurisdiction is my company and the, you know, like EU, gives me GDPR rules. My company gives me VPN firewall lockdown. And the yeah, only config go. I had yeah, to yeah. do was telling the company that I'm an enterprise customer and these are the, whatever the IP ranges or something like done. Mm -hmm. Great. I will hand you my credit card gleefully. I'll, but I will sh underhand shovel buckets of money at you. If it means that I never have to open up an Nginx config myself. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Like they will just, in fact, uh, is this, like that's just it. Is this actually the return of like late nineties, two thousands, like web engineering, where you will have a box underneath your desk? So when you're demo, when you're demoing it to your CEO or CTO, they're connecting directly to that machine, and then you click one button, and suddenly it deploys like to the rest of the world. Unbelievable. Oh, no. Yeah. Like th this is the map. Can like, we implement <laughs> FTP? I think I think that's what we should do. We should implement FTP on workers. That's a product idea. I should take back. So that oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. You you like. build that because I want nothing to do with building FTP. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, I mean, I it, like it's, but this is what I find so exciting about this space is we've been talking about this for, for barely an hour and the, the ideas just pour out. Right. And, and I imagine that like chat, what about you? I, I imagine there's, there's unlimited use cases here. Like what's happening in your brains. What do you want to know about this? We're coming into the, the home stretch here. We got 30 minutes. You got Sunil Pai on lock. He's paying attention. What do you want to know? Right? Like, what are the things that that you're curious about or excited about? What do you, what do you see being possible with this, this edge based world that, that kind of unlocks new innovation. Um, and while we're waiting for the chat to think, I, uh, as we were, we were doing like the, the 10 minutes of prep before we went live, you, you said something that, uh, was so funny, but I was in the middle of explaining something else. And so I didn't get a chance to properly react to it where you were talking about the, the trade-offs, of like the, you know, the server being like, like you're talking about servers and sizes, right? And and so I wanted to, yeah, to yeah. make sure that we get a chance to talk about this because it's it just made me happy. The code, that's just it. Like, and it's actually a pretty important architectural discussion to have, which is, would you rather fight one horse-sized server or 1,000 duck-sized CPU? <laughs> that is the architectural decision for Edge Compute. <laughs> and I like I love this so much because it, it really does start to um, it it changes the way that you think about things because like you might think oh well I definitely don't want a thousand distributed CPUs because that's that sounds like a nightmare to wrangle but then I'm thinking like well but hold on because I remember I used to have the the horse size server and the mm -hmm. major problem that I had with the horse size server is that I was always trying to find ways to get caches. And distributing that to a thousand duck size CPUs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of my problems actually stemmed from, look, at, okay, I have a server. This server does all the things in one place, and I love that. But if more than ten people at a time try to access it, the whole thing explodes and catches fire. 
So how do I distribute this logic in a way that allows an unlimited number of people to access it at the same time without our whole website going down? Um, And, you know, it it, like kind of it's like, oh, well, we just make new instances of the of the server. Oh, microservices. Oh, Ed, you know what I mean? Like and you start like naturally driving toward this idea of lots of distributed compute power. But the old Uh, model This was a phenomenon. So go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say that, you know, the old model just said like, well, we just need to make copies of the big server and put that in a lot of places. But we're, we're basically saying like, okay, but you can have that benefit by doing lots and lots of CPU around the world. But like the server itself doesn't even need to exist. You can just put little bits of logic instead of like a big monolithic core buddy that does all the things in one place. Uh, so this was a phenomenon in the 2000s that used to be called getting slash dotted. And it was very, a very interesting phenomenon because slash dot, uh, oh, what was the website? She said it was just called slash dot. Anyway, uh, which is another thing that's impossible to say on the phone. And I think that's why they chose the name. Uh, so the idea was that as a hacker, you would build something interesting and somebody would share it on slash dot mm-hmm. and you would get a shit ton of traffic and that would bring down your server. So mm-hmm. it was being called slash dotted. The similar thing happens nowadays if you get onto Hacker News or onto Reddit, right? Like, mm-hmm. and you don't have good caching setup. Uh, but the phenomenon was particularly interesting to me because it meant the people who would uh, uh, suffer the most were the people who were most clever and like the hacker mentality type thing. Like Slasher, uh, sla- uh, Slashdot would bring a whole uh, flood of traffic only if you were really good. And yes. which meant, which sucked because, and you know, I, I think that that was when part of the mythos of being able to scale became a thing amongst engineers because they're like, what happens if you get popular and things come your way? Which is why a lot of conversations about engineering in the early, I want to say 2010s or so were, what happens if we get, what is the RPS of your server? What happens if you get 10,000 uh, people uh, who attend your sale? And that's also part of the, inter- that became part of the interview process. Well, how do you do horizontal scaling? How do you do vertical scaling? And mm-hmm. When really that, that was a phenomenon of an architecture that couldn't stand that kind of traffic. But now in the edge world, bro, I don't give a shit, bro. Like that's... Uh, <laughs> Metal 5 will take care of it, right? Like, For real, I, I think about that a lot because I remember when I was younger, uh, earlier in my career, we'd be standing up somebody's site getting ready for for black friday or something and we knew like okay this is gonna we're gonna run a bunch of ads there's gonna be a, a promo everybody wants this 50 percent off deal we're expecting hundreds of thousands of, of concurrent viewers so i'm standing up like simulation software that's gonna just ramp up the number of concurrent connections and now if i were to try to do that with my personal site which i have spent literally zero seconds thinking about how to scale I would run out of memory on the simulation software before my site would go down. Like you just, it's the architecture is so fundamentally different now that scale is not even a, it's not even a consideration. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's, it's so weird because sure. Yeah. You might face this at like an edge edge case thing, which is, let's say that, I don't know, man, John Lennon comes back to life and has a one night only concert in London. (laughs) Sure. Okay that database is going to take a pounding but even <laughs> then you will do an up and only thing and you just stop it after a while uh, but having to scale a server used to be such a fundamental part of being a uh, and i don't want to say web de- network developer and now it's like a two days before you go live have we set up our caches with our provider yeah okay cool done yeah it's one tick item that's I love i love it when technology gets commoditized like this because it suddenly means we are now accessible well, this, the young, smart hackers can build their things and their servers won't go down when they're popular, right? Because right. We them this, this I love that. I love that. Okay, it, I have a, an idea to pitch to you. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm anyone, ready. Unless uh, anyone else doesn't have ideas. So this is my uh, pitch for what I call service as a platform. So this is something very fundamentally new mm. that I think edge architecture and edge providers can provide us. Uh, so internally at, face, uh, at Cloudflare, we call it workers for platforms. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't think there's anything fundamental about this with that. I, I suspect every provider will provide some version of this. Okay. So, uh, there, there are a number of use cases of companies, organizations, products 
that get a lot better if their users are able to upload code and these people can run it. So the two big ones that come to mind uh, are Shopify lets you upload code to make a shop. In fact, they just announced uh, this thing two days ago. It's called Hydrogen Plus Oxygen. Yeah. You can write React components for your shop and you upload it and Shopify runs it for you. And they're components for e-commerce. So I assume it's like a checkout button and a product carousel and stuff like that. Uh, but the fact is that Shopify can run this code. You can upload it for you. Similarly, I, I, I don't know if you know. Uh, I mean, of course, I suppose you do know this. Discord doesn't have its own bot platform. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because they don't want to spend their engineering time and ops and uh, also expensive maintaining a shit ton of servers where potentially the worst kind of users are uploading crypto miners or whatever the hell right. Right, like that they have to manage. But but it's why they don't have their own bot platform, and which is why you use somebody else's bot platform. Where, uh, it, the first thing you do when you try to make a Discord bot is that. So that's another use case. Uh, there are others that I can think of. So for example, Components AI is the one that I think of, and I actually spoke, spoke to John O'Tander about this. Right now, uh, you can store like HTML and CSS, but it sure would be nice if you could run MDX directly. Mm. Right, like you as a uh, what if your document that you stored to your database was MDX, and that's the right. thing, right? Like if you want to use MDX as a format, by the way, for the folks who don't know, MDX is basically JSX, but that looks like Markdown. That's that's about it. Yeah, let, um, me, let me share but, a link. If so, if you want to do MDX for your blog right now, you have to own all the code, store it all in your Git repo, and manage your blog on your in your Git repo. Uh, but if you want to use a service like Contentful or uh, Sanity, I guess, or I don't know what the ones are out there. Uh, what are these services that you can only store like JSON or like data or strings? You can't really store code there. Mm -hmm. But what if you could upload code to them so that every time you make a request, you get a response object? Hell, uh, the use case I think of is a product company that uh, shuts down between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, so that you can, uh, and based on where you're coming from, because it wants you to get eight hours of sleep. Like, sorry, no, we're not selling you any stuff right now. You well, go, go back to sleep. So a, a very real example of this is um, BH Photo and Video is uh, is like a, a AV equipment store. They will right. not sell you anything on Shabbat. They just, they're, they're a right, Jewish owned company. They will this. not let you buy something on the Sabbath. So, so that's a super real example. <laughs> right. Uh, like, no, but as a customer, what if you could do that? The other one that I think of, and this is the one that I will build at some point. So Auth0 is a multi-bajillion dollar company that, uh, and it's a multi-bajillion dollar company because it has features. Mm -hmm. Enterprises fucking love features. They make a long list of features and they're green ticks on it. <laughs> uh, and they also let you upload your own code. But what, if I had to build a competitor to it, what if I the API that I had was, okay, fine, we'll do authentication for you. So you can choose... Uh, Google, uh, Facebook, GitHub, whatever. But the authorization step is you upload a function that takes a user object as input and returns true or false. That's it. That's my whole fucking thing. You can make a call out to any other API if you want your Active Directory, or you can hard code four usernames, which are the people in your company as you're starting your startup. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a fundamentally new architecture, and I hope you don't mind if I do a brain dump on you. Okay. No, no. This is my. This so, is uh, literally what I wanted. <laughs> this is exactly uh, okay, okay. what I wanted. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so uh, there's something called the Hollywood principle when it comes to computer science, and that is the way that they tell you the difference between a library and a framework. Because in Hollywood, when you're starting out as a star, they say, "Don't call us; we'll call you." Right. So, right. So React is a framework because you provide it your components and it runs it whenever, right? Like it decides how to do the scheduling and when effects fire and so on. Whereas something like underscore is a library because you take the function and you call it, but like you actually call it, you pass it some data and it does some stuff to it, okay? That's the a problem good is that, heuristic. Right, uh, that, but the problem is that it's not even complete mm. because you do call react dom dot render you do call a function. No, that's fair. React. That's fair. And secondly, when you use underscore dot map, you do pass it a call back that it calls. Okay. So it. it's a good thing, but it's still never perfect because there are clearly mm -hmm. exceptions to this, like all over the place. All libraries take callbacks. Anyway, the reason that I brought this up is that the difference between libraries and frameworks is the same difference between services and platforms. So 
platform is something like Vercel, where you upload your code or Netlify or whatever, where you upload your code and it runs it in response to request responses. And a service is something like, should I say OAuth? Something like a database service, right? Where you mm -hmm. like actually call, uh, you say, hey, give me this data right now and it gives it back to you. Now, what if for services you could pass callbacks that it runs internally, like as a user? Right. If you, if you, if OAuth could provide you something. Now, the, the reason that I said all those use cases, in fact, the reason that I started with Shopify and Discord is that until now, until about 2022, uh, this has been the domain only of uh, big companies with Huge money companies. to spend on setting this up and ops teams and figuring you, out how to run it efficiently. If you think about just the spend on the team, and like mm -hmm. baseline millions, infrastructure, right you need to have probably a million, minimum half a million dollars ready to spend every year right? to build a platform. Right, like and, and nobody's, and, and time. You, you're going to take months mm -hmm. to do it, and who even knows if it works. You can only do this when you're a big company. You know which company is good at uploading user code and managing it and just running it cheaply for you? Fucking Cloudflare. Well, and... Edge providers. The, the, that's the reason. I'm saying that this is now a, a, a it's a technology that's very easy for providers right. to provide. So you reach out to Cloudflare or anybody else who does this in the future and say, hey, can we set up a platform? And it's four API calls, bro. I checked it out. You basically set up a namespace and then it gives you an API call for uploading a string of JavaScript and then you call it whenever you want. And it'll oh give you God. billing details. What I, it, what it, I love can, about this is I'm uh, I'm picturing you in like the executive pitch meeting where you're in you're like in there and just just to pull some quotes from our conversation. You're like, all right, all right, all right, everybody gather around. Okay, look, what do developers love? They fucking love features. And we can set up a platform <laughs> as a service, as a service. It's four API calls, bro. Like I just see you as like the <laughs> Charlie from it. It's That's always pretty sunny. much it's it. Like... <laughs> and no, what I like about this is because it's four API calls. It now means that you and I, for our side project on a Saturday morning, evening, mm. uh, can set up a platform where, you know what you want to make up? And the use case I, I think of, the one that I've been thinking of recently is nato.dev. Have you seen nato.dev? N-A-T-T-O.dev. No. Have, have a look. Uh, this is basically a live coding environment, one of those visual programming editors. Uh, and you can make like little blocks and like connect them. Uh, so if you, yeah, see like, and you can connect them and they have variables and there are a number of it like this, but it all runs client side. It's because this is the side project by this very smart dude named Paul Shen. And I assume he can't be asked to set up a platform for other people to run code on his servers. Right. Uh, uh, but I'm saying, you know what? You want to talk to Cloudflare, bro? Like we'll run your shit server side. It's fine. Like you can do anything. You can have secrets there. Uh, that will just run, and then you can expose it to other people to run as a function. Uh, so you want to store? Sorry, go. Well, I, I'm just I'm I'm imagining like the thing that's really exciting about this is I think every everybody who's building any kind of like developer focused tool will have a moment where they go, it would be really cool if our users could could customize this with code. They're all developers. Let them customize it with code, and then you immediately mm -hmm. say. No way. Setting up a sandbox environment is way out of our reach. And so you just walk away from right. that feature set, right? And that, to uh, me, I mean, that's a, I, yeah, I'm excited. You got, you have my attention. As a startup, as a startup, one of the big things you have to do is do fucking sales. And you go up to sales and the client is like, hey, I wish it did this. And then you have, you have to think of yourself, how can you roll out this feature for this one client, but as part of your whole product offering, you're like, no, let's say the client is XYZ, mm -hmm. uh, make a fucking file called XYZ.js, upload it to this platform and run it only for this user. Done. Like yeah. that's it, you're fucking done. Uh, and th this is what I mean, like what are the patterns that like the edge can enable? Sure, there's this performance thing that we were talking about. We were talking about developer experience and those are all incredibly valuable today. But what are the new novel architectures that we can enable for the builders of tomorrow? Where you, you know what, uh, you want to set up your own, uh, you want to set up a Vercel for your friends. Let's mm -hmm. say like you have for each of your Twitter followers. You're now at some sixty-five thousand, uh, something. For, Forty, something. yeah, sure. for, something like that. Sure, I, I was counting in dollars. You're not pounds. Uh, anyway, so uh, 
you want to say, hey, I want to just do a thing where if you're a follower of Jason Langstorff, you get like some 10 MB of hosting and you can run whatever thing in your as an edge function, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, but also for uh, 12 of your closest friends, you want to have like some specific feature Hell, or you want to like customize these things. These are conversations that don't end now with a fuck. That sounds like a lot of work. I do it in the future. <laughs> You know what every, I mean? It's very much every a... idea. I, I I'm not kidding. Every idea that I have these days, especially now, given that my job is mostly meetings, uh, I I get an idea and I get really excited, and then I look at an architecture diagram and I draw the second box and I go, "This is too fucking hard," and I just <laughs> I, I, right? I, 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 I like, can't do this. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't want to do this anymore. This is, looks like too much work. But now we're saying that something that has been the uh, that has been the only big companies with a lot of money and time and effort can spend on suddenly has become commoditized, which is, so the word I use is, I use service as a platform where every service suddenly becomes a platform. Workers, uh, Cloudflare calls it workers for platforms. Internally, we used to call it, I hate this name. It was called function as a service as a service, which is just, we used to say FASAs in meetings and it would derail the entire meeting when we said this. Uh, <laughs> I'm, th I'm still thinking of like a good phrase for this. Uh, I, sometimes I think of platform development kit. But point being that you now, not only can you use the edge for like compute, but you can now create like curated experience for other hackers and builders uh, very simply. Uh, and sure, those, has its, uh, those have its own trade-offs, right? Like not mm -hmm. all your users are going to be programmers, but sure, you can now offer it as an additional thing where you're like, hey, either you can click these options uh, to set it up, or if you have something custom, here's a little text area for you to write a function. Go nuts, do what you want. Do you want to use NPM modules? Go for it, whatever features you want. And I think that's that's the thing that I've been thinking about for the last month, two months, where I'm like, holy shit, like this is way different than uh, any builders have been used. It's a kind of tool that builders haven't had access to cheaply. Uh, for a while and uh well, that's and, and that, so that's my pitch like if you if you think about like uh, the other thing that's interesting about this is it's not just cheaply it's free to start <laughs> like you yeah, you can totally build free. this whole thing and you don't have to put a credit card in and just see if people use it and like if you scale if you get adoption you'll have to pay but like the experimentation phase is 100% no credit card required. And that to me is a legit game changer. I, uh, I actually just saw a, a comment that I love, which uh, Steph Dev says, I describe myself as front of the front end. And when I tell you that edge has made me dangerous, right? Like dangerous. I, I love, love that. that. Like yeah. I think that the, the thing that I find the most exciting, like the, the whole reason that I joined Netlify, that I get excited about edge functions, that I was excited about serverless functions is you have this ability to be a, a developer who would call yourself front of the front end and the skill sets that you have, the things that you already know, make you a full stack dev because the, mm -hmm. the learning curve is flattened so much. Right. And, and that's yes. the thing that I find the most exciting is like, if, if Stephanie's feeling like I'm front of the front end, but this edge function stuff feels approachable to me. Right. And like, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm, I, I came in front of the front end. I was a designer before I was a developer. I feel like I can reach into these edge functions or these serverless functions and build some pretty cool mm -hmm. stuff. Cause I get how the fetch API works. I know how to make a call to a third party service. That makes sense. I know what a request object looks like. I know how to use the MDN docs. Like, the world really feels flat when you start looking at these technologies and now it's kind of limited by your imagination, not limited by your willingness to wade through all the boilerplate and config and connection and plumbing or your willingness to put down a credit card and like say, hey, do I care about this side project enough to spend nine dollars a month on it to have a digital ocean server or whatever, you know, a, a render dot com instance running so that I can like build and hack on it. Um, it's just, it, no, it's free. It's accessible. It's it. super approachable for developers who have a, a front end skill set. And we can just, you know, we're, we're dangerous now. I, I love that. Bro, you used to have to be a Linux nerd to run a website. And don't get me wrong. Like I like Linux, by the way. Uh, but holy shit, that's the first thing that people would fail at. What do you mean? I need to install an operating system to host a website. Go fuck yourself.
Dude, like, like, for sorry. real. Well, like, and like, how much damage did we do in that? Like, I remember I, because I wasn't a Linux nerd, I didn't understand the implications of like shared hosting, for example. So I'm on GoDaddy shared hosting because it was $5 a month. And I was like, ah, that's probably fine. I had my first few yeah. clients. I put them all on shared hosting and then somebody was like, oh, you know, the big issue that you're going to run into on shared hosting is wasted space. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll go copy paste this cleanup script that'll get rid of like unused images. And I just Shit. whacked down to root, just nuked the whole fucking server. And of course, I wasn't oh paying for God. the backups. I wasn't paying for like, I wasn't, yeah. you know, I'm just this uh, like I'm a year into my career at this point. And I just had to go build three people a new website because I'd nuked everything lost all their data. Fortunately, there wasn't very much data, but like, what a nightmare for me. What a nightmare for my clients because I got thrown in way over my head managing a Linux server sure. instead of just building the front end, which is the thing that I understood. It's just a pain in the ass. By the way, when you said Steph, is that Stephanie Eccles? That is Stephanie Eccles. It's Stephanie so, Eccles, yeah. Hi, big fan. Follow you on Twitter. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> uh, anyway, so... Uh, that I've not felt about, like, see, that's, I think Java's, I think specifically JavaScript goes through waves like this, right? But mm -hmm. uh, you get very excited about some things and then like they sort of not, just, they, they normalize and they provide hell. They provide a great paying career, by the way, but they pay all the bills. Hell, they made, brought me to London. And then like, it's sort of like the rate of innovation, not only that does it slow down, uh, but it starts feeling like a little humdrum. And then mm -hmm. something like a React comes along and you're like, oh, shit, that's awesome. Wow, 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 we learned a bunch of things. Oh, React Native, now I'm a mobile developer. So like for the last two, three years, I shit you not, I've been feeling that same feeling, which is, a, okay, React is pretty stable now and we are exploring the space and we're doing a bunch of cool things, but oh, what the fuck is durable objects? I should reach out to Cloudflare. That seems interesting. And suddenly I'm like, wait a second. This is fucking awesome. Oh, what are you... What do you mean? Like that's just it. The first the first thing that hits me is the nine millisecond latency time. If you go to workers.cloudflare.com, it tells you what the latency is. Yeah. And I was like, what do you mean it's nine millisecond? That, that makes no sense to me. Uh, and then you're like, wait a second. So anybody can fucking write this. And and that my job was to build the CLI. I'm in such I get I, it's it's such a nice job to have because I get to take credit for all the hardcore shit happening behind it. <laughs> But I'm like, oh, I'll just ship ES build. Booyah. Now you got like TypeScript <laughs> support. Like, okay, I guess that's it. But I'll take credit for the nine millisecond latency and shit. So it's an awesome place to be in. And that's why like I feel so fucking excited. And that's just it. The nice thing about edge computing is that it's also like a boring bet where you're like, oh, wow, the trade-offs are clear. The wins are also very clear. And it's like for a majority of use cases, not just some use cases, it's usable today. There's value today. All you need to do is kind of like spread the gospel. You, Fuck it. Let's go. Let, let's get with it. I you know, love we, it. Th so the last time that you were on the show, I'm going to, uh, yeah. I'm going to pull that up actually, because it was a great episode. Um, we talked about ES build and uh, I'll link this That's in the right. chat for anybody who wants to watch. And I remember that one of the things we talked about was, was in this vein, you're talking about how it feels kind of humdrum, but like edge functions are a boring bet. And the thing that I find exciting about boring bets is that it is a guaranteed win. This isn't the thing yeah. that most of us do where we get three years into our code base and the tech debt is building up and we're getting frustrated and we're getting bored and we go, you know what would be easier than solving this tech debt? Let's burn it down and build it in a new framework. Right. Yeah. And like, yeah. you know, yeah. and we've seen people do this. Everybody, like we all went from Angular to react and then we went from react to next and now we're going to go from next to remix and like all of those decisions are decisions that come with benefits but the the really sticky messy part typically doesn't change with your front end framework like you you yeah, end yeah. up with all of these really hard okay well we've got somebody who's in india on a feature phone they are not going to have a great time loading a remix site from us east one they're, they're currently having a terrible time loading a next site from US East One. So how do we improve that experience materially? Edge compute. The framework doesn't fucking matter at that point. So th this, is, this is the, the thing that I think is really, really, really exciting. Um, yeah, Nikki, yeah, Nikki is, uh, is remembering the, the um, silver bullets only work on werewolf shaped problems, right? Which I, I swear that, that quote, oh, so I, I read that quote from you. It has been stuck in my head ever since. Um, I use it all the time. But it's just very, very interesting to me to like when you see something that's such an obvious win, 
right? It, at least for a broad swath of use cases. Like, the, again, not a silver bullet, but there are a lot of things that we're looking at that, like, we've been hacking around this either because we weren't quite ready to go serverless because we didn't like cold starts, or we've been dealing with serverless cold starts because we didn't want to deal with servers. Now we kind of yeah. get to say, I don't know, I'd like to have that cake and eat it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's fine if I can't connect to a database directly from one of these functions. I'll figure that out like later. Like there yeah. is an incremental value here. And we're we're getting there, right? Like these these sorts of things are, you know, in the meantime, you can do what I did, which is I, I have a serverless function that caches the first call because the data doesn't change more than an every hour or so. So I can just do that. I can just use this this cached thing and it's basically like loading a JSON file from the edge. Cool, great, fast enough, I'm happy. I don't really care if the TTL is is an hour or even a day or whatever. Uh, would I build a stock picker off of it? No, but you know that's would I show the latest stats from my analytics? Yeah, I don't care yeah. if they're an hour out of date. Like whatever. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> also, stock pickers. Are, can I tell you something meta? Like just yes. reminiscing on 100%. something. One hundred percent. Actually, that's just a, a Steph's quote on uh, being dangerous. Also, and the whole thing about like edge functions and this thing. So. Uh, I, I I might have discussed this on your last uh, on the last time I was on, which is I, I did very badly in college. I actually did really well to get into a very good college. And then I discovered uh, weed, I, uh, a serious girlfriend. I got into the college band. I did everything <laughs> fucking wrong. Okay, I, I, I did really badly in college. Uh, and that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Like, trust me, like... Anyway, that's all. That's a conversation that can't. <laughs> that's for the. That's the but, after hours. Yeah, <laughs> learn right? with Jason after but dark. I was <laughs> right, but I I was left in this place where I couldn't get a good job where all my other friends did so well and got high paying jobs. Mm. And at the time, JavaScript was there to save me. At the time, it was a toy language. People didn't give real real engineers didn't consider it seriously. It was a toy language. Uh, the fact that a woman had to teach it to me was. Uh, something that I will never forget. Uh, it was always the, it was never, uh, because women weren't considered real engineers and some might say mm. a lot of people say that now as well. And I'm like, go fuck yourself. Anyway, uh, JavaScript was there to save me because they were like, you know what? Hey, if you are willing to write a little bit of JavaScript to provide interactivity for, at the time there were rich uh, RIAs, they were called rich interactive applications or something. Yeah, shit like yeah, that. yeah. People would pay money for these frameworks, EXDJS, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it was there for me then. Uh, then uh, browsers got a good debugging story uh, with Firebug, mm -hmm. and that made it made me slightly more serious. Then browsers started getting frameworks. I remember Prototype JS, of course, jQuery, mm -hmm. etc. And I became a little more serious. Uh, Node came out in two thousand and nine, and JavaScript then made me a backend developer, right? Mm -hmm. like, right servers. Uh, React came out, and it made me a functional fucking UI developer. That was amazing. Bro, I shit you not. Like, my, the company I was working at the time, they decided to shut down the website and go app only. And I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? And they're like, you're smart. You'll figure it out. I bought the Objective-C book. I bought the Java book. And I didn't open it. I was like, this sucks. I'm going to have to find another job. And I shit you not, two weeks later, React Native was announced. And uh... I became a mobile developer. What a fucking day. We were the first company, uh, I don't know, across the world, but definitely in India to put React Native into production. Aside oh, nice. That. Yeah, it was really good. We uh, suckered Viju into giving us access to the beta. Anyway, that's also <laughs> anyway. So I became a mobile developer. I could have become an ML developer as well if I studied TensorFlow, but even that's like a little hard. Uh, uh, I and now it's making me a serverless full stack developer. Mm. So I've had like really great timing. Uh, I remember, uh, and I've always been like experimental. I feel like that's kind of my vibe. Where I like, oh, there's cool tech. I want to try it out. CSS and JS, this that. And for a while, because I was on the React team, like that identity stuck to me, which is like, oh, he's like a React guy. But bro, I don't want to be a fucking React guy. Like that's not, that's like not my scene really. Yeah. Well, it is my scene, but because it was interesting, but that's not my identity. My identity is, oh, I want to use a technology to enable people. And I wanted to enable, I want it to provide the kind of social mobility and opportunity and friendships really that it has brought into my life to other people. So if I can make a framework, a library, or even make the CLI easy, uh, that's what I think like JavaScript does. And that's uh, to pontificate a little bit. It feels like that's what edge functions also does. It suddenly elevates a whole group of people to achieve yes. very ambitious plans. Yeah. That's what I you can like. do. You can do yeah, more with less. And that's the core 
thing. And I, I'm going to make that the moral of the story because unfortunately we ran out of time. Uh, I was thinking that we might be like, oh, I don't know, 60 minutes. Maybe we'll be out of stuff to talk about. I could go for another two hours. Sunil, thank you uh -huh. so, so much for taking the time to hang out with us. I'm going to give a shout out to Ashley from White Coat Captioning, who's been doing the live captioning all day today. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I'm also going to drop another link to Sunil's uh, Twitter. Make sure you go and follow 3.1 on Twitter. And uh, I dropped a link to the schedule in the chat as well. Make sure that you go and check out the schedule. We've got so many good episodes coming up, including a couple that are relevant to what we talked about today, such as uh, Auth0. I'm going to be talking about their new actions interface, which allows you to execute yeah. arbitrary code as part of dealing with Auth0, right? Cool stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, make sure that you go and check that schedule out. Sunil, any parting words for everybody before we wrap this thing up? Uh, man, everyone's like, it's been a rough two and a half years. And honestly, sometimes it feels like it's only gotten worse. Uh, it feels like this is a time to lean into the fundamentals of life. So relationships, mm -hmm. uh, staying healthy, uh, finding a gr good group of friends that you can trust, uh, and JavaScript will always be there for you. So, uh, <laughs> those are the focus points, I guess. I love it. Sunil, thank you so much. As always, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Likewise, Jason. Find... Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's been a blast. We're going to find somebody to raid. I think uh, let's see, it looks like Ben is live, so we're going to go raid Ben. Thank you all for hanging out. We will see you all very soon.